Uh, my name is Abhiram Karupur. I'm a senior in the chemical engineering department. Um, and I'm the chair of the undergraduate associates here at the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. Um, we're co-hosting an event today with the Center for Information Technology Policy. Um, and we're very excited to welcome uh, Jessica Rosenworcel, who's a commissioner in the Federal Communications Commission. Um, and she's going to be um, doing a Q&A with uh, Professor Nick Feimster in the Computer Science Department, um, covering a broad range of topics from net neutrality, 5G, um, and how those intersect the finance and public policy spaces. Um, so I'm going to introduce Professor Feimster, and he's going to tag team and then introduce Commissioner Rosenworcel. Um, the plan is he's going to ask a couple questions, we're going to have a discussion, then we're going to open it up to you guys um, if you've got any pressing concerns or queries that you want addressed. Um, so just a quick bio, uh, Professor Feimster um, joined Princeton in 2015, the computer science department. Um, prior to that, he worked for nine years at Georgia Tech, um, again in their computer science department. Um, his research deals with uh, internet censorship, information control, home access networks, and software-defined networking. Um, he was named to MIT Technology Review's list of the top innovators under 35. Um, in 2010, um, and uh, he earned three degrees from MIT, bachelor's, master's, and PhD, um, but he decided to come here because we're superior, as he knows. Um, so without further ado, um, I'll let him take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Abiram. And b before I forget, I, I would like to thank uh, Abiram for actually organizing this event. Uh, for, um, Commissioner Rosenworcel wouldn't be here with us today uh, without some uh, really uh, enterprising initiative from undergraduates like, like Abiram. So thank you very much. We owe him a great thanks for, for, uh, for this event. Um, let me take this opportunity to introduce Commissioner Rosenworcel. Um, uh, the Commissioner's um, been at the FCC for quite some time, uh, since, uh, since 1999, when she worked uh, in the Wireline uh, Bureau. Uh, she's been a commissioner there, with a, I guess, with a brief um, hiatus since about 2012, uh, where she's worked on a number of issues that we're going to talk about today. Of course, I'm sure many of you are quite familiar that the FCC has been fairly involved in net neutrality and uh, related topics. We are going to talk about that. Um, but there are a couple of other things I wanted to, to sort of draw your attention to and where we're going to start. Um, uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel has been a, a fierce advocate for bridging, bridging the digital divide in this country, and in particular talking about something called the homework gap, which we're, we're going to talk about um, quite a bit. Um, she also is the only female commissioner in the FCC right now, and she spent a lot of her time uh, talking uh, about how to bring uh, underrepresented groups, including uh, uh, women, into uh, the tech policy uh, discussions. And I'll take this opportunity before I forget to um, point out that she has uh, this year started a podcast called Broadband Conversations that is uh, exclusively devoted to this topic. and. Um, uh, for that, I think we owe you a, a great debt of gratitude, so, so thank you very much. Um, we're going to come back to diversity and inclusion at the end of the panel, um, but I wanted to um, uh, first um, start by just asking a little bit about, uh, a little bit more about your background um, uh, and also about the FCC. So I think we have a lot of students here. It's great to see that. Um, I think we should probably first just start by talking about, like, what is the FCC uh, and how did you get there, and how did you become a commissioner? What, and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. All right. Um, I feel like I should start by saying thank you for having me here, and also that somehow I, you might want me to tell you a story about how when I was really young I wanted to be an FCC commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know, but that's not the truth. Um, uh, it doesn't start that way. But I, uh, I studied... Uh, economics as an undergraduate, and I come from a family of folks who are deeply involved in science, so I did the most rebellious thing I could think of. I went to law school, <laughs> and I uh, spent some time working on the privatization of publicly owned telephone companies, trying to identify how to make a public entity more efficient for a competitive market, and uh, work with uh, authorities to make that happen. And then Congress passed this new law, the 96 Telecommunications Act. And I had the opportunity as a fairly young attorney to head to the FCC and help implement it. I worked there on staff and then worked for a commissioner there. 
And then I headed over to Capitol Hill, where I served as counsel to the Senate Commerce Committee. And while there, a lot of uh, <coughs> big things in technology started to happen. Uh, we had a transition from analog to digital television. We had multiple spectrum auctions. And about 10 years after 9-11, I worked with Senator Rockefeller to come up with an idea for repurposing broadcast spectrum, sending some of it to all of our mobile devices for more capacity, and sending some of it first responders for public safety use, uh, an idea that the, uh, the president eventually took up and spoke about in one of his State of the Union addresses. And then shortly thereafter, I was offered the opportunity to go to the FCC as a commissioner. So that's, that's really how it all happened. And I uh, continue to be there today. I am, at the moment, as you mentioned, the only woman and the only Democrat. So my position is sometimes contrarian. Uh, I have some difficulties with some of the things my colleagues do, not all, but uh, I think I should call that out from the get-go. And the FCC. Federal Communications Commission has been around since 1934, but today I think it's more dynamic than it's ever been because communications and technology, by some counts, <coughs> one-sixth of the economy in the United States. I mean, that's your broadband, it's the broadcast television you watch, it's the cable facilities that come into your home. It's how you get your wireless devices to work. It's the wired devices in your home. We oversee all sorts of technologies and all sorts of pipes that deliver you new technologies. And uh, as a result, the profile and authority of the agency has grown as these things have grown more important in our economy. And there are supposed to be five commissioners at the moment. There are four. And we make a lot of decisions about how the agency and how this country should approach technology policy. Uh, and um, on a day-to-day -day basis, there are decisions on satellite, wireless phones, spectrum auctions, net neutrality, you have it. A lot of big decisions coming out of the agency as distinct from coming from Congress right now. Excellent. So uh, I guess we'll, we'll talk about some of those uh, later as well and how the authority of the FCC is, is shifting in various ways. Um, I wanted to start by talking a little bit about the digital divide uh, and the homework app. And I think for this topic and, and others that we talk about, sort of like to talk about what's the current situation. And then we have a lot of students in our audience today who are um, hopefully the future of, of both the tech and the policy. And uh, I'd like to also sort of orient some of our discussion about where do we go from here? What do we do next? Um, so I know the, the homework app is, is, is something that, that, um, that I, th I think you coined and, yeah. and certainly talk a lot about. Um, Maybe you could talk a little bit about um, what, it, what is that? What is the homework gap? Um, and, then, uh, and then maybe we could talk a little bit about you know, what's the state of broadband and, and, and how that, how, what that has to do with the homework gap. Right. Well, the digital divide to me is there's a, lots of communities in this country that are not connected. The broadband is not deployed to them. Or there are communities where the price of adoption is so great that they're unable to bring <coughs> all of digitization into their homes and that will reduce the economies of locations that don't have it. We've got to figure out how to get service to everyone everywhere in this country. But that's kind of an abstract notion. So I felt like let's try to think about the harms of being one of those folks who are not connected. And I spent some time around the country visiting schools to figure out how to get every school in this country connected to broadband particularly in rural areas. And what I kept on hearing over and over again was it's not just about being connected in school. That homework now requires being connected to that seven in 10 teachers assign homework today that requires some form of internet access. But all the FCC data show that one in three households still do not subscribe. And where those numbers overlap is what I call that homework gap. And I think it's an incredibly cool part of the digital divide, and it's something that we can laser-like in a nonpartisan way focus our energies on to fix. Um, and when you see it up close, I, I was with uh, Senator Udall in New Mexico, this rural town, and we spoke to this football player in a high school there who would take the bus out after school an hour and a half just to go play games in the nearest community an hour and a half back, and then would sit in the pitch black dark of 
the school parking lot to use the free Wi-Fi just to do his homework late at night. And there are stories like that all across the country, kids sliding into booths and doing their homework with fizzy drinks and fries because the fast food restaurant's the only place to get service. And I just think that when we talk about the digital divide, we should start talking about kids <coughs> and homework because I think it makes the realities of being unconnected just a little clearer to everyone. Yeah, I remember, I think, from your, your oversight committee, your most yeah. recent oversight committee hearing, I think it was the senator from Wisconsin also giving a similar story about how uh, kids basically going into <coughs> freezing parking lots outside of schools just because that was the only place they could get Wi-Fi connectivity. Right. It's pretty visceral. So instead of just focusing yeah. on the abstraction of the digital divide and getting everyone connected at a certain bandwidth, speed, or capacity, let's just figure out how to get every kid connected. Because according to the Senate Joint Economic Committee, there are 12 million kids in this country who do not have internet access at home. And I just think it's within our capacity to try to fix that. Yeah. I think part of the, um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about how we fix it, but I think part of it, um, and certainly I guess it's, it's no secret, at least to, to the commissioners and certainly to the oversight committee, that um, part of that is, is data, getting better data. And um, you know, there's uh, sort of the, shall we say, um, universally critiqued broadband maps. Universally um, critiqued is about right. Um, so for those, I think for those of you who aren't familiar and, and the commissioner can talk a little bit about it. The FCC produces uh, broadband maps talking about uh, coverage of different places um, and uh, census tracts in, in the country. And uh, maybe we could talk a little bit about, you know, why do we have those maps? Like, what's the role of these maps? Um, what's the state of these maps? And, you know, how good's the data? And, you know, how can, how, what is that, what role does that play in investment? And, how, you know, how can we do better? Yeah. Uh, our maps have problems. That's the short answer. Mm -hmm. The longer answer is, if we want to connect everywhere in this country, we have to start with knowing where service is and is not. Right. Uh, you can't manage the problems you don't measure. And right now, our broadband measurements are not what they should be. The FCC has historically measured broadband through census tracts or earlier through zip codes and has made the decision that if there is one subscriber in a census tract, we should presume that it's available throughout. And on the basis of that methodology, the agency has concluded there are 24 million Americans who do not have any access to broadband. But what I find interesting is something that was just actually in the New York Times, I think it was just <coughs> yesterday, um, Microsoft decided to do some of their own testing. So let's figure out where people are using our services. It's a kind of rough proxy for where broadband is and is not. And they found 163 million Americans do not have access to broadband. Like, needless to say, there's a pretty big delta between those two, two numbers. But it's apparent to me that the truth is probably somewhere in between. And we've got to, with laser-like precision, start to understand where service is and is not. And our existing methods of data collection frankly are not going to bring us there. I, I like the, the comments from the senator from Montana, I think it was, where he said, if I can send a text from my back porch, like, is that good enough? Yeah, uh, right. right. So I think basically we, we don't really have good ideas of what constitutes coverage at this point. And that's, yeah. that's a tech question as well as a policy question, isn't it? Isn't it? Um, yeah. I mean, I think one of our problems is that we're trying to solve this in Washington. Right. I, I really believe that the best broadband map is not going to be created by people sitting in Washington. It's how do we push that effort out to the states and cities and towns across the country and encourage kind of a broader citizens initiative to identify where service is and is not. I mean, I know I'm from New England, and when I go back and visit my parents, I can tell you exactly where on Route 30 you start to lose service right. on my wireless phone. I mean, I could, I could look at a map and I could highlight it for you. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that most of us have lived experiences like that. We're going to have to find ways that we can aggregate that lived experience and inform what the FCC is doing. Because in Congress and at my agency, there are billions of dollars that we want to spend on making sure broadband gets everywhere. But we don't know yet with adequate precision if we are spending those dollars in the right places. And I think that's a really big problem. 
So I guess for, for everyone out there thinking about this, better maps, better data, and, and crowdsourcing, right? You've uh, talked absolutely. about crowdsourcing yeah. a lot. I, um, so if you want to say well, anything I think we need to be that. open to every idea that could help us improve our data in Washington. More crowdsourcing would be interesting. Having communities and colleges across the country decide to test on their own would be mm -hmm. neat. Mm -hmm. I think the FCC's should make more use of a speed test app that we have now deployed on about 200,000 phones. Mm -hmm. If we could take that data in, if we could have our engineers in our 13 regional offices do some testing as well. And you know, I, I got into a back and forth with Senator Baldwin at that hearing you just yeah. described. I said, well, why don't we think about how we repurpose the infrastructure we have today? Like what if we took every postal truck mm -hmm. and outfitted it so that it tested as it went along the roads I mean, they travel virtually everywhere in this mm -hmm. country. How do we rethink the infrastructure we already have to help us get where we need to go? Mm -hmm. One more question before we move, to, I guess, um, on that postal truck idea. Of course, uh, Amazon is the new postal service. And, um, but I guess my broader question there is, what, what is the role of sort of uh, private industry uh, in, in sort of helping make, give us better maps? I mean, there are uh, certainly for-profit companies in the area of performance measurement, um, what kind of role you know does does private industry play in improving the maps, or is, is this just a, a sort of you know government and, and um, civil servant kind I of exercise? I think we have to be open to a lot of different ways of doing it. The first broad effort at mapping took place in the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act in mm -hmm. 2008. Mm -hmm. There was a law in there called the Broadband Data Improvement Act, where funds were given out to every state to try to identify ways to just start mapping mm -hmm. where services are. It's amazing to think that was only a decade ago. Yeah. But um, some of that was done with some private sector actors. Some was done differently. I think we have to revisit that initial effort and really be open to any way we can improve our data. So I guess once, once we have better data, the next thing is to kind of like do something about it, like uh, invest in deployment and, and Certainly, um, as the topic of our panel suggests, one of the ways is 5G. And I think you even talked about 6G. Um, so I haven't even figured out what 5G is myself, and we're going to talk about 6G. But um, <laughs> so I think, um, you know, again, I think for the benefit of this audience, it would probably be helpful. You know, we should talk a little bit about, like, you know, what's 5G? Like, uh, you know, we keep hearing about it. Like, what is that? And, it's you know, so buzzy, right? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it does appear to be a, a marketing buzzword a bit. But, um, you know, what is it? Um, and, and I guess related to that, like, what's this whole spectrum thing that the FCC seems to be, to be doing a lot? Of? Yeah, it thing. seems like, you know, the FCC does a lot of work in spectrum. I don't know if this audience, like, you know, they probably like to hear a little, a little bit more about, like, what's going on in spectrum? What should we be paying attention to? Um, I would argue that the most important infrastructure that we have today is invisible. You can't see it. It's the airwaves all yeah. around us. And the choices we make about zoning those airwaves have a lot to do with how many bars you have on your phone, whether Wi-Fi is available, yeah. you know, if the Internet of Things will actually grow and work. In other words, we identify spaces in our airwaves and reserve them for different kinds of services. And we need to make sure that those services can operate adjacent to one another without interference so that we can take the scarce resources, the scarce resource that's our airways and try to make um, abundant activity. Uh, the FCC traditionally does that through licensing airwaves, often sold through auction, mm -hmm. although some portions of it are reserved for things like unlicensed and wireless. And um, the new, new thing right now is to talk about 5G. And I think the best way to talk about 5G is to talk about 4G, which is the wireless standard probably everyone here has in their phone. Um, it's, uh, there was a point at which you know, about 50% of the world's deployment of 4G took place on our shores. We've only about 5% of the world's <coughs> population. And as a result of that early adoption, really the applications economy developed here this universe of things that you expect to be able to do on your phones is all a function of bringing 4G broadband capability to that device that probably everyone here has in their home or pocket or purse, or if you left it back home, you're already thinking about where you're going to go pick it up and when. Uh, that was 4G. But we tend to have new standards about every decade. And so in 2020, we expect 
5G to be more commercially available. I would describe it as having three essential elements. First, speeds that are gigabit capacity, much, much faster. Second, much less latency, which will make it more valuable for a whole bunch of uses, including in um, vehicles and cars and things that are really sensitive to learning information fast. And then also, uh, they'll be more energy effective. Mm -hmm. Now, right now, uh, carriers are, are in a race to all say that they're going to have the first 5G devices, 5G networks, 5G <coughs> everything yep. available. I still think, candidly, it's early days. Right. And we're still trying to identify what's the optimal mix of spectrum bands to make that next technology viable. But the rest of the world is watching our right now because our success with 4G was so <coughs> substantial. The smartphone revolution happened here. Yeah. And I think we are watching other economies um, get far more aggressive at deploying the next generation of wireless networks faster <coughs> because they want all of those scale economies to come to them first. It seems like there are a couple of, I mean, this somewhat boils down to how do you make most efficient use of the available spectrum yeah. that you have? And yes. some of that is you know, reclaiming <coughs> spectrum that's been allocated through through auctions, um, uh, creative use of the unlicensed uh, yeah, spectrum. Right. Um, where do you see all of it coming together? I mean, on the one hand, you have ins these incentive auctions. I know the FCC has just started having these, mm -hmm. these auctions um, versus, um, you know, spectrum sharing uh, approaches versus, um, you know, better databases about who's, who's in various parts sure. of the spectrum. Um, and how much of it is a pure, um, policy discussion versus like are there places where technology is going to come into play and make uh, spectrum sharing easier? I know you've talked a little yeah. bit about AI and you know, um, uh, decentralization. Well, for the, the like um, wireless novices, yeah. before I get too weedy on this, I would say that our spectrum and wireless policies have always had this kind of binary quality. Mm. On the one hand, we license off our airwaves to the carriers you've heard of. We sell them off at auction. They purchase those licenses. They power your phones and other devices with them. They have an exclusive right to use those facilities. On the other hand, we have public activity from unlicensed, which most people know through Wi-Fi, which is a little bit like you all follow the rules of the road, and you can all participate in using Wi-Fi, and you don't have to have a license. But over time, this kind of system, this duality, it's like not a function of physics. It's just the way that policymakers have organized spectrum. It seems to me to be really self-limiting. And as we demand more and more from our airwaves and connect more things and do more, we've got to be more creative than just have this kind of binary system. So we are starting to explore different <coughs> theories of access with our airwaves. Like um, we have this 3.5 gigahertz band where we've come up, instead of having this binary system, we have a hierarchy of rights. We're letting government military radars have a preemptive right above all else. But they use it so occasionally mm -hmm. that it seems wasteful to just tell them that they have a license for it all the time. So then we set up a secondary system where you can go and purchase licenses at auction from the FCC so the carriers can come in and get a right. But then we even set up a tertiary right which is, why can't we just have Wi-Fi if nobody's using it? And I think those kind of systems of um, hierarchies of rights, simultaneous access, are going to become the new normal. We're not quite there yet. And if we like propel ourselves even further to the future, we should be looking at distributed ledger technologies and blockchains and how we can almost in real time manage access to the airwaves so that you don't have sort of this clunky yeah. government sitting in the middle dictating who can get access when. Another <coughs> aspect of 5G, of course, is just smaller and smaller cell size. And um, I guess that might pose some additional complications for you know managing shared spectrum. Yes. On the one hand, you have you know the ability to, to share spectrum you know, in different geographically dispersed regions because the cells are a lot smaller. Right. On the other hand, no single entity is going to be able to you know, keep track of what's going on in each cell. Is that, is that where your ideas may, may come in a little bit more too, the, you know, decentralized management? Yeah, yeah I, I just increasingly believe in that it can't uniquely be the government mm -hmm. sitting around and offering you out a license that 
we don't need to be the Department of Motor Vehicles, right? right? Yeah. Um, we don't need to have long lines for using Spectrum. We need to figure out ways that uh, there are more options for more innovators and they can get access to it more rapidly. So dynamic spectrum access systems, like I mentioned, distributed ledger technology, we need to be looking at all of these things so we can take this scarce resource and make it more abundant. Uh, and then I guess finally on, on, on this topic, you've talked about 6G. What's that? What's 6G? Well, you see, every it reminds 10 me years, of, yeah, I know, yeah. that's really far out there, but every 10 years, yeah. we tend to have a new wireless standard. So 2020 is 5G, and, I, and I, we came across um, uh, an official from China talking about them being first in 6G, and I don't know, it piqued our interest. And Umer Javed, who's here from my office, and I started doing an awful lot of research. And we do think there's going to be terahertz frequencies and spatial multiplexing and speeds a thousand times faster than 5G with network densification so that we have microcells instead of big towers built into everything we do. But it's a little bit out there. I, um, I decided to jump the gun and start talking about it, but I will freely admit it's still uh, still got some science fiction qualities to it. Yeah, and I guess like just to wrap up, like you know, in the spectrum discussions, it's like every article you read has a different spectrum band that people are talking Always, about. Yes. It's like you've yes. you've written about 2.5 and 5.9, and you know, there's a lot of discussion about C band and. Um, 24, 37, yeah, 49, really and yeah. um, <laughs> but. Um, what does it mean? Like, I mean, for the non-nerds, if you will, like, um, what should we be paying attention to here? Like, uh, mm. you know, because it's it seems like no matter what you're looking like, you're looking at it's a it's a different band. Do, do, does it matter? I mean, for the for the for the typical person who's paying attention. Okay, so yeah, ten thousand foot. If it all works, it, you shouldn't have to know about it. Got How it. about that? Yeah. Um, uh, but then I would say my like crash one minute course in spectrum would go like this. Lower spectrum bands propagate further. Yep. Higher spectrum bands, like the 28 gigahertz band we're working on, there's some work on right now, don't propagate very far. You might be able to send the signal from here to that corner. Mm -hmm. And however, they have much more capacity. Right. So you have this trade off between <clears throat> capacity and propagation. And as we all start watching more wireless video, we contemplate a future with augmented reality and virtual reality, that capacity is going to be more important to us in some circumstances than propagation. So we're trying to figure out how to have this mix of sending the signal far and getting a lot of capacity. Mm -hmm. And again, I'll return to, if it all works well, you don't need to know very much about it. Perfect. <laughs> um, so you can choose to learn about it or not. <laughs> um, the next thing I, w I wanted to turn a little bit to, to net neutrality. Um, I think we'd be re remiss, remiss not to talk about that. I guess, yeah, you're not supposed to know anything about that anymore, right? Um, but uh, I guess I think what we should first um, uh, sort of talk about is, you know, what is it? I mean, I think everyone in the room here probably thinks they, ha you know, w know what net neutrality is. But I think the reality of it is, is, is that they're about. It's probably a definition for each person in the room. So, I think if you could sort of unpack it a little bit for for the audience, you know, talk about the, you know, bright line rules, transparency. Like, what are? How does this all fit together? Uh, and well, I think of net neutrality in a simple terms as being, you should be able to go where you want and do what you want without your broadband provider getting in the way or telling you what websites or content or services are available to you online. It should be up to you. And if you think about it, that's been a principle that's been present in communications policy for a really long time. I mean, when you pick up the phone to make a call, you expect to be able to call who you want, when you want, and you don't expect the phone company to edit your conversation or restrict how and when you can call. And those same principles should be applied to broadband in our online world. That's what net neutrality is about. And last year, over my objection, my colleagues rolled back our net neutrality policies. And so as a result, our broadband providers have the legal right to block websites, throttle services, and censor online content. I think that is a stunning change in our communications policy and not particularly good if you consume or create online. And many of our providers have said, oh, well, we won't do those things. But it's just been my experience 
that if a company has the business incentive, the technical capability, and the legal right, they will exercise that ability over time, and it will reduce the openness of the internet experience we all know today. So um, again, over my objection, my colleagues rolled that back, but there's been so much activity mm -hmm. in the wake of that. Yeah. Um, and you know that's worth pointing out because. Can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, yeah. uh, there's been there's been legislation in four states. Um, I think you have the stats, yeah, so you're ready to roll right. them off the tongue, right? Um, legislation pending in 30 states. The government. So, what's going on here? Like uh, every state's doing is. So what's going to happen? Is are we going to see federal action on this? Is every state going to go off and do their own thing? Is What's next? What's what's happening here? You know, when I first was appointed to the FCC, I didn't think that millions of people even knew what the FCC was. But somehow, after our net neutrality proposal came out, millions of Americans found us, and they wrote us their deeply held opinions about internet openness. They emailed us. They jammed our phone lines. They fouled up our internet comment system. Uh, John Oliver did a little bit on that. Uh, um, it's been good business for John Oliver, too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think that's probably fair to say. <laughs> anyway, um, and uh, well, there was a vote, I think, the, uh, there was a poll taken by the University of Maryland on the, uh, around the time that we made that vote. We found that 83% of the American public favored the FCC's existing net neutrality yeah. policies. So it's really one of those moments where there wasn't a lot of division in the country, right. but Washington went somewhere else. And I, I think, for shame, we did not listen to the American public. And that's distressing. But what's not distressing is that that activity awoke this sleeping giant. The public was really angry mm -hmm. that a few unelected bureaucrats were able to make such far-reaching changes to how we access content and go online. And as a result of that, what we saw was incredible. We saw this democracy in action, because suddenly there were 23 states attorney general suing the FCC. I, I don't recall 23 states attorneys general coming together on anything with that right. speed or force. And we had some 36 states that had legislation pending. Four states, uh, Washington, Oregon, Vermont, and California have passed net neutrality laws. We have 100 governors who've signed on, more than 100, no, excuse me, more than 100 uh, mayors who've signed on to a net neutrality pledge. We have six governors who've required it in every state contract. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what we're starting to see is a level of activity in courthouses and state houses, um, in legislation and litigation, because we're being sued on this. And the United States Senate passed a resolution trying to overturn what the FCC did. It's not yet proceeded in the, the House of Representatives. I mean, all of this energy comes together and that's actually how democracy is supposed to work. Yeah. That all of our organizations that we have and institutions we've built up to provide alternatives are starting to do that. And even a year after its passage, I don't see that the energy on that has let up. And uh, I think that's a terrific statement about public awareness. And it gives me some optimism that we're going to change course. Do you, um, do you have any predictions there? I mean, are we going to stay with uh, state laws? Is, is Congress going to step up here and say, hey, wait a minute, we don't need 50 laws. Let's, let's, let's have one you know, law, federal law on, on net neutrality. What do, you, what, do you, what do you think might happen? Oh, predictions are above my pay grade. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I do think there will be litigation. There will be legislative efforts. Uh, I don't think the story's yet written on this. I think the public's dissatisfaction with what the FCC did, however, is clear. Yeah. I wanted to go to, to privacy uh, next, um, but before I get there, I think one of the other things that, um, of course, the FCC's kind of stepped aside now, for better or worse, and you know, one of the, um, the things that often comes up there are, um, in, in DC language, we can sort of unpack it for folks, but it's <coughs> often talked about as parody, right, where the the Googles and the Facebooks uh, and the, con the Netflixes and the content providers are on sort of one side of this, and the ISPs and the mobile carriers are on a, on a different side. And um, there's a lot of discussion about, hey, should there be basically one set of rules for everyone? Um, and that comes up in the net neutrality discussions, even more, I think, in privacy, which we'll talk about next. But 
What are your thoughts on 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 those kinds of arguments, and, and well, you know, what do you think should happen? Well, take it from the consumer perspective, right? If yeah. you were to hold a mobile device here in your hand, it is kind of strange to believe that your wireless provider is subject to one set of privacy laws. Right. Your operating system might be subject to another. Mm -hmm. The manufacturer of your device, the applications. And from the consumer perspective, wow, that would be really hard mm -hmm. to stay on top of. And the lines are being <coughs> a little bit blurred too, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. And yeah. so the question is, how can we make this more simple? I mean, because you shouldn't have to be a network engineer to know what they're doing with your data. And you shouldn't have to be a lawyer to understand if your information's protected. Right. One of the things that strikes me about all of these conversations about privacy policy is that we talk about transparency, we talk about choice and security. I hope we can also talk about simplicity. Right. Because I think with simplicity comes trust, mm -hmm. and then we can have more trust in our digital world and the ecosystems that are developing. That being said, I think with privacy, the FCC has been pushed aside by a Congressional Review Act um, last year, which took us out of the mix on broadband. And right now, Congress has taken a fresh look at what privacy policy should be in the United States, which it's historically been really sector specific. We have privacy policies for health care or for children online. But should we have an overarching privacy policy? And I think the pressure is on largely because of activity in Europe and California. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it's certainly an issue to watch in the next year. Yeah. I guess given limited time, we probably. Can't, don't have time to explain how the FCC got into privacy rulemaking, but I think for, for, for relates to net neutrality, and I guess for better or worse, the FCC is a little bit on, on, the side, on the side of that now. Is that fair to say? Um, um, but I think we should still talk about privacy since, uh, since the, it's the topic du jour, and um, certainly the FCC had a role in, in rulemaking in the past there. Um, I guess um, to, to give the to the short version, right? There was a there was a point in time where the FCC had authority to write rules on privacy for a specific broadband, broadband yeah. privacy, uh, but not the Googles and the Facebooks, and right. etc. And uh, is it fair to say that now um, we don't know what's going to happen next, or do we have a do we have any idea of, of what might happen? Um, do you think, for example, that um, the content providers might get subject to similar sets of laws that the ISPs might be su subject to? Uh, where do you see this going? I think we're going to have a lot of congressional hearings. Mm -hmm. um, and there'll be uh, a lot of folks watching what's going on in California mm -hmm. and in Europe. And uh, there'll be probably over time an effort to try to develop a more comprehensive policy on this. but. I think there's consensus for the need for one. There's not consensus on what that policy is yet. Mm -hmm. Or is there even consensus on who should be yeah. the, who should be involved in doing that? I mean, is it the, is it you? Is it the Federal Trade Commission? Is it Congress? Is it the Federal Trade Commission has historically had been seen as having a greater role in privacy policy, although their primary privacy <coughs> policy derives from Section Five of the Federal Trade Commission Act, which just prohibits unfair and deceptive practices. So in practice, it, it gives people a lot of ability to put privacy policies in fine print and evade their oversight and authority. Uh, we've got work to do on this. I think, um, I think that's going to be a big focus of congressional activity next year. We're going to be very busy. Yes. So, um, OK, so I think maybe now I'd like to turn to, um, before sort of opening it up to the, to the, to the audience for questions, um, a, a different topic, but one that I think you've spent a lot of time and effort on is is broadening participation in, um, in uh, technology and tech policy and so forth. And I think we could certainly pull a couple of different threads here. Um, at the outset, I mentioned um, the podcast. Um, you know, you both as a, a representative and a voice for uh, women in technology. Um, maybe we could just start there. Yeah. Can you sort of talk about um, about your role as as a as a, as a uh, a woman in technology and in tech policy and in Washington, and what's that like? Um, um, this is really just a, a function of lived experience. I, I got to this role, and I, I get to spend a lot of time in places in Wall Street and Sand Hill Road, and I started mm -hmm. noticing over and over again I was the only woman walking into almost every room. Mm -hmm. And. Um, as it came to pass that I'm the only woman at the FCC, we just decided, what can we do to amplify the voices of some of the people we've met along the way? Lovely, yeah. 
And so we started uh, this uh, podcast, Broadband Conversations. That's my talking to women. You can, you can get the joke in that. Yeah. And, um, and so we invited people that we've spent some time with to talk about technology policy. We had Senator Cortez Masto, who has a great Code Like a Girl bill on STEM education. Uh, I spent time with Kimberly Bryant from Black Girls Code and Maya Wiley, who's on MSNBC, but who previously worked in uh, doing digital equity projects for the city of New York. So we've been just inviting people to come on who we think are um, just doing really cool things so we can amplify their voices and make their presence known to more people. Excellent. Um, do you have any, anything you'd like to sort of impart to um, to the to the women in the audience today about you know Gosh. Um, about <coughs> advice technology oh, you know any, anything that you'd like yeah. to say about your own experiences um, wow okay um, if I had to put something on a bumper sticker I would yeah. just say ask for permission less go ahead and do things um, I think uh, I think all of us and women especially. Uh, wait for permission when in fact proceeding is often the best way to go. And um, I guess a, a sort of a re on a related topic, I think you've also um, talked about the need to have more technologists yes. in Washington and in the policy yes. discussions. And yes. um, uh, I think we, in a conversation leading up to this, we talked about how you know you could count on one hand the number of technologists at the FCC um, yeah. you know, during certain proceedings. Um, and we have a couple of them in the room here, actually. Um, right, no, no. So. Amir and I were talking right before about we're, we're having this huge revolution in satellite technology. Instead of sending up constellations with 20 or 30 satellites, we're now contemplating constellations with thousands, like this kind of fabric that would cover the Earth and develop all sorts of new forms of connectivity. And there's so much potential for crash and debris in that. And we have like a handful of people who know satellite policy at the agency. And when you think of the volume of those devices and the number of experts you have, what you realize is we've really got to grow our ranks. I am um, long ago in front of the uh, IEEE, I advocated for the agency to start an engineering honors program, which I'm proud that we now have done, to invite young people just out of school to come in and spend two years with the agency and work on neat wireless things, including satellites and um, so we can start replenishing our ranks and bringing more tech technical expertise into the FCC. And I think it should be done across Washington, but at the FCC we've got a special need for it. Yeah. I guess on the, on the flip side too, I mean, one aspect to sort of bring the technologists into the commissions and, and the agencies, um, I kind of thought I knew, uh, you know, everything there was to know about measuring broadband access until yeah. I showed up at my first FCC measuring broadband America room and um, as if you were the only woman. I think I was the only technologist yeah. in a room full of lawyers, and I actually didn't know what I was walking into. Right. Um, and this, the things that come out of people's mouths, <laughs> I was like, okay, I think we need to have more technologists in the room yeah. here because either uh, either you don't know what you're saying or you do know what you're saying, and, need, and both are bad. Um, <laughs> yeah. But... Um, um, but how do we fix that exactly? I mean, that's cultural a little bit, right? I mean, opportunity that was started during the last administration, which actually continues in this one with the U.S. Digital Service, yeah. uh, mm. which is built off of some of the ideas from Code for America, inviting people in to try to figure out how we can create a center for technical expertise and then export those individuals to other parts of the government to help with databases and management. But I do think it's incumbent on the leadership of every agency and organization in Washington to think about how to bring those people into their inner circle. But just like you have people who are experts in the law right. and communications policy, right. you need to bring someone in who's got technical expertise. Uh, I think there are so many things we can learn from having those people in the room that I hope the next generation of leaders in Washington doesn't think about that as some organization chart somewhere down here on the flow chart, but people who sit in the room where things happen. We need more of that. Um, and I guess to that point, do, how much um, do the technologists, how, how much familiarity should they be having with the law and policy side? Well, they're going to get some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's unavoidable, you know, right? Unavoidable. If you want to get something done in Washington, you are going to figure out how to navigate yeah. a whole bunch of laws built for the analog age. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I have some optimism that they can help us be creative about that. Excellent.
Um, well, thanks. I think that that pretty much wraps up the, the topics I wanted to cover um, with, with Commissioner Rosenworcel. And that leaves us actually of, uh, about 15 minutes or so to, to take some questions from all of you. I, I see one hand up in the corner uh, over there. I think Thanks noticed. for your presentation. I, I think even today the New York Times, they talk about yeah. an Oregon high school. Yes. Or, or I'm sorry, where the students are congregating to one of the district's public libraries. Right. Just to that point. You mentioned about the 6G and, the, and this potential. Aren't you going to overburden that uh, by so many people getting on that and the short broadband? Eventually, that's going to kind of, you know, defeat the purpose um, because it's a short, as you indicate. So, if we want to increase the capacity of networks, there are three things we can do. First, we can bring more spectrum to market, and we're now looking at higher band airwaves and how to make sure we can grow capacity with that. The second is we can build more towers. And also, not just the towers that you all know from a distance when you're driving on the road, small cells, and build these pizza box-like size facilities into our buildings to bring in more capacity that way. And then we also have to think about those dynamic spectrum technologies I described, where instead of just having you get to use this all the time, I'm going to figure out a system of shared use so that we can have more capacity. I think we're going to need all of those techniques to manage just what you're talking about. And I have some confidence we're going to develop them over time, but it is absolutely imperative to make sure that we can manage what's coming our way. And just a quick follow-up, what in that light, why can't we get cellular service in some of the outreaching areas, Montana, you yeah. know, some of those dead areas? Well, first, we are going to have to deploy more towers. And the economics of tower deployment are harder in areas where people use the service less. And we're going to have to come up with systems that help finance deploy and operate those facilities because we've got some areas of this country that will always be hard economic cases. Is that Verizon and T's responsibility or the government's? Or, or I think it's shared in some shared. of our rural areas. I think we've got to figure out how public resources can kickstart some of that deployment. It's just one last point. It's crazy. I'm up at Lafayette College. Like You can't get right. internet at Lafayette College. I think that's nuts. And I'm, I'm willing to bet that our maps do not reflect that. <laughs> Turning to our earlier point. Yeah, we had a lot of um, discussion earlier. I mean, we talked a lot about spectrum, but another aspect of this, too, is, um, is, is what's in the ground. And I, I think you've yes. had some, maybe we could just spend a minute talking about that. I mean, there was something called the Dig Once Act, yeah. right? And maybe you could talk a little bit about what's going on in the ground with, like, fiber. And, you know, 10 years ago, it was like fiber is the future, and yeah. now it's like, well, Maybe, maybe it's we, fixed wireless. Maybe it's yeah. fixed wireless. Maybe it's uh, hybrid fiber. Co maybe we're right. going get, to get away with you know, the existing cable. Info. So what's going on in, in the ground? Uh, um, we need to build fiber facilities out closer to all of us, mm -hmm. even if it's not the last mile. I, I think these dig once policies, both at the federal and state level, are really important. So every time we build a new road, it adds only 1% to the cost of the project to put some fiber aside it. So if every time we have a construction project with roads, we just decide to pack fiber adjacent to that road, we're going to preserve a lot of possibilities for the future. And we've now come up with a federal policy for that for federal transportation projects. Hmm. If we could replicate that at state and municipal levels, we will over time make sure fiber facilities get to more places, which helps not just wired broadband, it helps wireless as well. Thanks. Well, thank you. It's wonderful uh, to meet you today. Um, it's a low bar in Washington, isn't it? Yeah, I really <laughs> want to live on. Yeah, I want to live on a high fiber diet. Yeah, and some of us do, but some of us don't have that opportunity. Uh, but what what about things like the merger between AT and T and a major content yeah. provider? Mm -hmm. uh, that seems wrong to me. Mm -hmm. The transmission people and the content yes. people really should. Any trust they really shouldn't so, um, be the same. The way that that merger was structured, there was no FCC review. It was reviewed by the Antitrust Division of the Justice Department, which um, took the companies to court. And um, the judge found no compelling antitrust case there. However, they are appealing that, which is fairly unusual for a large transaction, given that the transaction has already taken place and the murder's already happened. Nonetheless, I think that that is a court case worth watching. 
And I think there's also a discussion in Washington about the continued viability of our existing antitrust policy. Um, I'm not an expert on it, but antitrust policy has devolved to this assessment of the consumer welfare standard, which is if you combine these two companies, will consumers be worse or better off? And that itself has devolved into this battle of competing economists about possible price increases down to how many cents. And it it's, um, it's really feels a little far from our experiences right now. Economists always get it right, of course. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that before, <laughs> say, from economists. Yeah. But um, from uh, when so many digital project products are free today, this feels like a very strange system to use to continue to evaluate transactions. I think I saw a student question here, yeah. And, and then you Thank can you for the it. conversation. I wanted to hear your thoughts on a um, recent thing I read. It says U.S. government recently reached out to allies and warned them not to engage with Chinese telecom firms about mm -hmm. development regarding 5G. I was wondering, do you think it's more of just the, the part of the framework of the whole Trump government's trade war thing, <laughs> or do you think the Democrats would have done it as well? That um, how, how urgent, do, do, how critical of a state are we at in terms of uh, the U.S. competing with other countries in those? Mm -hmm. Do we really have to get an edge over other people, or could there be a collaborative future? Or, or um, just want to hear thoughts yeah. on this generally. A lot of good questions in that. There are security concerns associated with some of those other companies, which are expanding rapidly worldwide. And there is government investment in those, country, in those companies. Uh, and there are questions of whether the US should start to develop a better supply chain for itself that doesn't require the use of foreign equipment. Mm -hmm. um, I think the bigger question, actually, for network deployment in the short term are the tariffs that have been opposed, uh, that have been offered by, through the administration. Uh, nobody's except sort of like Washington nerdy types are combing through the U.S. Trade Representative's list of tariffs. But if you look at it, it includes routers, antennas, circuit boards, all sorts of things that are used in the in the development of networks, and many of those products are themselves. Um, manufactured right now in China. And so by adding a tariff to them, we're starting to add expense to the deployment of networks in this country mm -hmm. as long as we continue to use those pieces. And that is something I'm actually more worried about right now. I think our tariff policies are going to have a negative effect on deployment in the United States um, if we don't soon reverse them. Yes, please. My question is about the homework gap. And uh, in particular, so I've heard a lot of innovative policies pursued by municipalities as well as seeing interesting pilots undertaken by libraries. But just want to know two things. First, um, are you seeing any of those pilots sort of scale up and affect, you know, start to close the gap? Yeah. And second, what can the average <coughs> citizen or student do to help with this issue? Because I was in the New York City subway, yeah. free Wi-Fi. I saw a young so, right. student mm. lying or on the stairs doing her homework. I know. It, it's, um, it's chilling when you see because you think these are the kids with extraordinary grit. They're finding a way to make it work. We should want to do everything possible to help them. Now, I'm finding most of the inspirational activity taking place right now on this outside of Washington. And uh, I will tell you like, about a little town like Winterset, Iowa, about 25 miles southwest of Des Moines. In fact, I, Madison County. Yeah. In fact, I think they, they originally planned to call it Somerset, but it was so cold, so they called it Winterset. <laughs> um, <coughs> and they found that they were having this problem. Kids didn't have access at home. And then the schools and the teachers were wary of offering certain types of courses and certain types of homework that they felt were necessary because they were worried about digital equity in the homework app. So they did something really low tech, which is they built maps. And they decided to map out where in town broadband and Wi-Fi would be available for students. And some of those places were so predictable, like the library, municipal offices. But when they went around, they found that like a bakery was willing to offer, and some other places that they've done this, insurance offices. There's, they did something like this in a town in Georgia, and the, the Walmart stepped in. And then they gave them all decals to put in the window. They say, we're a safe space for homework. And those decals started multiplying around town. And, and you know, just what a message that sends. Like, your community cares about you as a student. We're going to try to help you succeed. And then it raised awareness. 
How can we bring in more low cost programs? How can we talk to our existing wire cable providers about low cost opportunities for students and their families? And I think that kind of local activity has real impact. Now at the national level, I'm trying to do some work to figure out how some of our late upcoming possible spectrum auctions, we could take the revenues from those auctions, which can often be in the billions of dollars, and reserve some of those funds for loaning out Wi-Fi hotspots from every school library. Because I know from my travels and talking to school libraries, that is one of the most effective tools they have for the students who do not have a way to connect, to simply loan them out a Wi-Fi hotspot. And if we could create a national program to assist school libraries with that, I think we'd make a big difference. Are the, um, on the homework app, and to follow up on the question, um, are the carriers at all uh, involved in this? Yeah. I know, I know um, as part of some deal, it's, yes. um, uh, I know Comcast had to do something at some point yeah, to, to, of, to um, provide low cost. Um, what, are, what, are, what are other carriers and providers doing in this space? Many of the providers have low cost internet programs. Yeah. And um, some do a lot more outreach than others. Yeah. We're going to have to figure out how to publicize those as well. But we're definitely going to have populations that are not comfortable with recurring costs right. of participating. Mm -hmm. And um, mm. we're going to have to come up with some other solutions as well, though I do think some of these providers are doing a good job trying <clears throat> to promote that mm -hmm. and make it known that those services are available. Mm -hmm. so, and some of that presumably involves uh, having the infrastructure there in the first place. I Absolutely. Mean, Comcast's right. low-cost uh, Internet service offering isn't going to do much good in an area that right. doesn't so we have, have a, that. We have a mix of uh, problems. We have areas where the deployment exists, but adoption <clears throat> is low because of the expense. Mm. Um, the status yeah. of the household, the student might be moving between households, and then we've also got areas where there is no deployment, and that's a different kind of problem. We're going to have to address both. both. Yeah. Um, maybe from the back. Uh, Hi, thank you for a great talk. Um, there has been a lot of talk uh, going on recently about the network slicing as a method to um, upgrade our current infrastructure and to make it fit and support the online technological advancements. But um, if I understood that properly, I also see it as a perfect method to enable uh, achieving non-net neutrality. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about your thoughts about um, the ways that network slicing can be used while preserving the um, network neutrality. Yeah, I think that's a conversation that I wish that we could have right now at the agency, but given that my colleagues have sort of pushed that aside, but I don't think it's impossible to think about network slicing and, you know, the evolution of software-defined networks. You do a lot of work on that without committing to the values of network neutrality. But that is a more nuanced conversation. We're not having it as a result of rolling back those rules. I don't know. Do you have thoughts about that? Um, I think that... Um, some aspects of programmable networking certainly yeah. um, they bring these questions of net neutrality a little bit sure. more to the forefront. Yes. Um, when we started working on programmable networking and exchange points, there was like a lot of we were like, hey, this is really cool. You could actually do traffic engineering and peering specific to video. And then it was like, whoa, wait a minute, is that like a service specific policy? We're not sure if we like that. So it could cut either way. Um, in I think some that. Sense. Um, it's worth trying to identify how we can have the basic values of network neutrality, but not impede those kind of developments. Yeah. Um, although, that, let me distinguish too, yeah. because when we talk about network neutrality, we talk about services with the ability to access fundamentally all points on the internet. And often we talk about network slicing and some of these things to do much more specific and right. narrow activities. And that might be a theory of distinguishing between the two. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point because one of the reasons you may want to slice the network is to carve out a portion of it just Which for, is for um, you know, some unique medical, medical devices. Or, I was say, yeah. yeah, a unique um, medical device. Right. And if, in fact, it is uniquely for that, you're not talking about accessing the entire universe. And as such, it might be something that I think could be easily exempted from net neutrality policies. Yeah. It's, it's actually worth pointing out some of those exemptions. As we have this discussion, you know, one of the exemptions is for reasonable network management practices. And of course, that's, that's, right. a, that's sort of a, a thorny term, but this is one example where maybe there are, you know, slicing, you know, certain aspects of it that I, are and network, I think you know. a lot of um, those who criticize network neutrality don't believe these two things are compatible. But I think you see us now talking about how there's a universe in which we could make them that way. Right. On your uh, web page and the FCC website, you have a lot of very interesting articles that you've written, like op-eds 
for many different publications. I noticed that you, for the ones listed, you had, let's say, three on Huffington Post and one on Wash po Washington Post, which is okay. fine. I'm, yeah, I'm, politically, I'm, not sure I'm, that, yeah. I'm politically neutral, okay. by the way. And, but I noticed that there were no publications that I saw that were like on Fox News or Breitbart.com. <laughs> and I was wondering if that was by your choice or by publication's choice. Um, well, first, I think I have one on Washington Post. I, I, don't think, I think I only have one that was on Huffington Post years and years ago. Um, uh, we just, we reach out, we try to generally reach out to publications that are perceived as mainstream or neutral or with an audience that we believe would be receptive to some of these ideas. But I've published in everything from the Washington Post to The Hill to Politico to Cosmopolitan. Mm -hmm. Right. So, That's you know, my it's point. pretty I'm not pretty diverse. Yeah. in any way. I didn't, yeah. I voted for a third party candidate. So no, I know no, that's no, right. no, I didn't. But it's I did like, notice there were no, three articles right. in Huffington Post and one in Washington Post, but zero mm -hmm. in, like I said, Fox News and Breitbart.com. Mm -hmm. I was just curious if you just didn't see those type of publications as being receptive to you, or were they not, did they say, we're not interested? Um, I, w I will admit that those, we haven't, we've tried not to reach out to too many deeply opin opinionated types of places. We're trying to reach out to more uh, publications that don't take one clear side or the other. I'll note that your, like, like uh, your, uh, your, um, your comments on decentralization and blockchain would appeal to the libertarians. Probably. Yeah, my DC, um, no, believe me, I have a lot um, of, I have a lot of, let me, once you start talking about blockchain at some level of detail, yeah. There's a whole community that starts to follow you that you didn't know existed. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I need to do. Yes, okay. That is exactly um, true. That's, yeah. Okay. That's um, why you have all those Twitter followers. Um, yeah. One more question. No, maybe. wait. But I have that, and also, yes. I did spend some time with Joe Rogan on the Joe Rogan podcast. You know, so I we try to keep it diverse. <laughs> <laughs> we have. I've been on Comedy Central too, so you know, we're not discriminating. Uh, I'm sorry that I'm not that funny, but uh, yeah. You rely on people interviewing. Uh, maybe one. We'll do one and then two. Okay, okay perfect. And, and then I'll turn it back to you. Uh, thank you for coming here today. Uh, you mentioned briefly about the fiber and roads. And I was wondering what it took to get to that point, or what was the chip, what it took to get to that point, and what do you think are the next steps in terms of cooperation between, for example, DOT and FTC? Uh, really good question. In my ideal world, I would like every federal grant for transportation funding to be conditioned on these kind of best practices that would facilitate fiber deployment. Um, and I think it would be great to also recognize that most roads are not just federal. We have a lot of state roads and municipal roads. And if we could replicate those practices at every level of government, we would start crisscrossing this country with fiber that is uh, ready to be connected for the future in ways that I think would really long-term help us with infrastructure. One last question. Uh, thank you so much for your talk so far. So um, I guess coming from, going back to the idea of net neutrality and the vote there, so coming from a place where I'm not really knowledgeable about how the FTC or the voting process works, mm -hmm. but uh, listening to you talk about how 83% mm -hmm. of public opinion favored not repealing right. uh, the net neutrality policy. Like, can you sort of describe like the process in which the vote came out of the way? It did, but, like, yeah, like well, let I me tell you, your struggle and mine is similar. Yeah. <laughs> um, I uh, there are five people who traditionally vote, and three votes will carry the day. Uh, we, uh, I didn't agree with my colleagues. I think we have to take note of broader public input into the ed regulatory process. And this was certainly an issue on which we had broad public input. Uh, so I find it regrettable that we didn't at least acknowledge the public anger on this issue. Uh, but regarding like sort of what your colleagues believed, <laughs> like um, at least for me, it's, it's always been a little difficult to find uh, sort of the, the core arguments that, that motivated people to vote against the repeal. Obviously, there's a lot of people that, that, that's just like, oh, uh, pie is a snake. Um, 
and the like. But, but like, I, I'm sure that people who were making decisions had a, a thought about yeah. the decision process for making this and like having a, a clear idea of what motivated them to. Well, let me do the best. Yeah. It's always weird, but you know, it's a good exercise to try to like Put people, what's there. the argument yeah. on the yeah. other side. Um, I, I think their argument would be a general aversion to government regulation, that the fact of government regulation can get in the way and thwart the kind of innovations we were talking about with network slicing and other activities, and that it is a preferred universe to not have oversight that would impede those innovations. Um, I would argue back, because I have the last <laughs> word, <laughs> I would say that in a competitive marketplace, I would favor less regulation and oversight. Mm -hmm. But the fact of our broadband marketplace today is about half of our households have not a choice of broadband provider. So if your broadband provider starts mucking around with your traffic, throttling services, or censoring content, as a consumer, you can't take your business elsewhere. But in a world where you could, this could be a factor. And one I would be more comfortable believing that competition could resolve. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Right. So, so thank you. I mean, that, that brings us to... Um, that, that brings us to the end of our time today, and I just wanted to take a, 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 a minute to, to thank um, both Commissioner Rosenworcel. I think um, t today, I guess it's worth pointing out, we have a, a national day of mourning recognizing one of our, our uh, great American heroes, uh, 41. But uh, I think we're also uh, really fortunate to have Commissioner Rosenworcel in the room today. She's definitely a hero of mine, and uh, I, I hope many of you as well. So really, thank you very much for your time today. Um, really appreciate it. And um, finally, I would like to thank again Abiram, uh, whose, uh, you know, his, his diligence and um, his enterprising nature really made this event possible. And I, I owe a personal debt to you uh, to have this opportunity. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.